going to spend probably at least six or seven weeks uh, really opening up, so I don't feel like we have to be in a rush to try to uh, preach and teach all of these uh, ideas and, and uh, liberative concepts uh, in one or two sermons. And we're going to have a few guest speakers to come in to kind of help diversify the perspectives uh, that I hope will open up and unlock some liberation for a lot of us. But I am one who am uh, firmly becoming more convinced uh, Patrick said this, and, and I, I think we all hopefully can believe this, that our liberation is bound up together, uh, that our freedom and our salvation is bound up together. And certainly we that uh, have been shaped in Western Christianity uh, do often take a radical individual uh, uh, perspective on salvation uh, and don't always appreciate that when you read the New Testament, uh, it is rarely spoken uh, in the singular right, that many of the, the tenses of not only the verbs but the nouns are plural. And, and in many respects, uh, one of the great challenges, I believe, of Western uh, culture and spirituality is we become so individualistic that we uh, forsake what Dr. China just said, that uh, we are created to be in relationship. Now, that's both a a blessing and a curse, depending on who you're in relationship with. I wish I could talk to somebody today. Amen. Because how many of you have been in relationship with folk and you just wished that you could do that thing all over again? It's like, ooh, I wish I'd never met you. And I wish, uh, so, so, so just being in relationship is not necessarily uh, uh, the final uh, verdict. We want to be in healthy relationships. Relationships that are life-giving. Relationships that speak truth to us in love. Relationships that catapult us to be better, to be more faithful, to be the fullest expression of who God has created us to be. So I, I, as I was thinking about how to launch our series and uh, which text to use, you know, I, I was planning to preach every uh, sermon that I preach and, and others, um, you know, really lifting up some of the, 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 the ways in which God interacted with women, Jesus interacted with women, the way women interacted with others. And I was led um, to this passage of scripture uh, that is a, a call narrative. It is one of many call narratives in the biblical text. It is one of the many narratives where uh, an epiphany happens, where God reveals God's self to a person or a people in a way that leaves them radically changed. And in the course of this epiphany or this call narrative in Exodus chapter 3 that we'll be reading, God is actually making this revelation to Moses. Now, of course, Moses is not uh, a woman. Um, and yet, at the same time, I'm more compelled by how God reveals himself and what does God do as part of God's revelation, because I want to suggest that if we are going to see one another well, we must first use God as our paradigm for how God not only sees us, but how God engages with us in real time. Because quite as is kept, if you are a follower of Jesus, you don't get to make up your own rules. <laughs> My God today. Now, I know, you know, it's, it, you know, uh, it's easy in this moment we're living in to, to just rewrite the handbook and make it fit what we want it to, to fit. But how many of you know there's a reason the Scripture says there is a way that seems right to us? But the end is destruction. And in no other discipline could you make up your own rules and get to success. Can you imagine if you was trying to change the tire on your car and you looking at the little uh, 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 tutorial, and you're like, I'm not going to follow that. I'm going to change this tire the way I want to change this tire. They tell you to use a wrench, and you say, I'm going to use a hammer. 
They tell you, use the, is that the, the, the lift? And you're like, I'm going to try to pick it up myself. Now, you, 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 you may eventually get that tire changed, but you're going to have a few scars, and that tire may not work that well, and your car may be a little jacked up. Hello, somebody. So the tutorial is not your enemy. As a matter of fact, one African uh, 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 Father Augustine, he says that the word of God will be your adversary until it becomes the author of your salvation. Huh? Uh, if you like me, I be tug, tug of war with that word all the time until I give in and be like, okay, have your way, and then salvation comes. So part of what I'm hoping as we launch this series of Sawu Bone is that we may be open to seeing how God's revelation through God's word, through the history of God's people, through the testimony of the saints, and certainly through the disciplines and the language of our contemporary moment can all add up to helping us, as we say in the movement, get free. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell them, I'm just trying to get free. I'm just trying to get free. That's all I want. I want freedom. I want freedom. Here we go. Exodus chapter number three, verse number one. Uh, Moses. Everybody say Moses. Moses was shepherding the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, he led the flock to the west end of the wilderness and came to the mountain of God, Horeb. The angel of God appeared to him in flames of fire blazing out of the middle of a bush. He looked, the bush was blazing away, but it didn't burn up. If I was in an old school church, I'd just stop and preach that. Uh, but I'm not an old school church, so I'm going to keep on reading. Moses, verse number three, said, what's going on here? I can't believe this. Amazing. Why doesn't the bush burn up? God saw that Moses stopped to look. I want you to trip on how significant it is that the creator of the universe saw Moses looking at this bush. There are a lot of other things you would think God could be distracted by. But for some reason, the eyes of God get trained on Moses as Moses engages in this epiphany experience. And could it be, my brothers and sisters and loved ones today, that God wants to stop whatever God is doing to look at us in the everyday experiences and circumstances we are dealing with. I mean, that is, again, a blessed or scary proposition because some of us don't want God looking at anything we got going on. But God called to Moses out of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, Moses said, yes, I'm right here. God said, don't come any closer. Remove your sandals from your feet. You're standing on holy ground. Then God said, I am the God of your father. I'm sorry. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, afraid to look at God. Any of us ever been a little fearful look to, to kind of face God? Anybody? Is that just me? All right. All right. Now, this is where uh, we'll take the majority of our, of our preaching today. Verse number seven. God said, I've taken a good long look at the affliction of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries for deliverance from their slave masters. I know all about their pain, and now I have come down to help them, pry them loose from the grip of Egypt, get them out of that country, and bring them to a good land with wide open spaces, a land lush with milk and honey, the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hevite, and the Jebusite. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to launch this series off, so I will bone about your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God. That is read for us, the people of God. I ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please allow your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy 
Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Today is uh, the day we will remember the Lord's sacrifice and our shared commitment one to another through the sharing of Eucharist and communion. And it is no accident in my mind that uh, our Sabubona series will start and should start on the day we remember our shared communion with God and one another. For it is indeed our highest aspiration that we should live in community as Christ followers and certainly in harmony with the creation that God has given to all of us as a gift. Now, it is important for you and I to continue to appreciate that on this day when we come to the table to be reminded not only of Christ's sacrifice, but also of the common uh, salvation we share, that that is what binds us together as one body. Being bound together as one body, living together in community, is a difficult task particularly when we have the awareness of difference among us. Because quiet as is kept, many of us, community is often predefined by or for us. We don't get for the first many years of our lives to pick which community we are a part of. Often our parents, our circumstances, our family, our neighborhood, they actually define community for us. So we go through much of our lives kind of just going along with the wave and the momentum of other people's decisions. And as you get older, you then start to pick and choose, all right, you are not going to be in my community. Because you're a piece of work, and I, I, I can't deal with this right now. Or you have affinity towards certain type of people. The socially constructed categories of race, gender, sexuality, nation, uh, 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 class, all of these, these categories, they start to pull on us and, and cause us to raise our hand and say, I want to be a part of that community. But how many of you know when you enter the community of Jesus. You don't get to pick and choose <laughs> who God saves. It got quiet in here real quick. Now, I, 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 I know many of us would like to pick and choose who God saves, but you ought to be careful trying to pick and choose who you think God's going to save. Because that may be an indication that you own a short list of who God may exclude. I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. See, our families, our neighborhoods, our nations, our religion, our stories, as we get older, they all add up to create a community that we are often a part of before we even realize we are that community. And one of the great gifts, I believe, of Christian faith, particularly the body of Christ, the church, if you will, is that when you look around this room, some of the folk in here, if you saw them on the street, not only would you not talk to them, some of us would turn and walk the other way. You're like, oh my goodness, I don't know who this is, but they looking at me kind of weird and I'm a little shook. Some of us would not hug. You know, we go on around, I thank God for you. Woo, I thank God for you. You see this person on the street and you, they say hi to you, you'd be like, no, don't, don't talk to me. I don't. Am I right about that? Ain't that something that just being inside this church community strips away some of the difference that you may have as a filter? to keep you from seeing that we are all actually created in not only the image of God, but we share in common the salvific work that God has done through Christ on the cross. 
Now, it's so important for you and I to hold this intention. Why? Because we are living in an age and a time where community is often now being not only fragmented or parsoned off by difference, but difference is now being criminalized, problematized. And as a follower of Jesus, I want to submit to you that difference is not a reason for you to cut yourself off from that who may not be your clone or your replica. Hello, somebody. I mean, one of the great truths that we hold as Christians is that when we say God, according to uh, Gregory of Nyssa and many of the Orthodox fathers and mothers, when we say God, we mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That our confession is that God is not just uh, this, this uh, catch-all phrase, but there is a definitive revelatory expression of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that our God is one God who lives within a community of three persons. Not person like me and you and you, and if I don't like what I got to say, then I get to go talk to the other one to get a second opinion. But the theological term there is called perichoresis. And it talks about an interdependence within the life of God that does not have separation but does still have distinguishing. It does not mean we are not one, nor does it mean that we are fragmented. But the perichoresis reinforces this notion that even in our oneness and our unity, we may not have uniformity, but we still have interdependence. Now, I want you to think about how that vision of not just God, but that vision of life in a world characterized by difference would play out if we really believed that I am dependent on you for my full existence. That I can't cut you off because you're different than me. I have to learn to see you with the same kind of eyes that God not only sees you, but hopefully God sees me. That this idea of Sawubona that I see you, and then in return, because I see you, I now am seen. This idea that I cannot see you and see myself apart from one another is arguably one of the most important, I think, grounding principles we must lean into, given the rhetoric and the diabolical conversations being had in our public discourse today. It's not lost on me or hopefully any of us how terrible this despot named Donald Trump and, 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 and all those who would seek to not only defend his rhetoric, uh, how damaging they have become in this moment to the psychological and physical well-being of anyone who would be determined as different. It is, I think, one of our greatest tasks in this moment, then as the church, to lean into a conversation around difference and learn how to have not sharp edges, but, you know, like I, I used to lie, like riding bump, bumper cars. You know, when I was in a bumper car, you know, and I used to think I had bars, you know, that's like, you know, you had handles on the, on the car, so you'd be driving, then you make a quick turn. But you knew that even if you didn't clear that other car or that corner, corner you had what? Some rubber bumpers that would catch the force of the blow. So it would not destroy or harm the other person nor yourself. 
versus the way some of us drive with, we think we driving with bumper cars, but we don't got no bumpers. And our insurance rates are quite challenging, praise God. How many of you know it is important for you as a follower of Jesus to be a bumper car in the world rather than some, you know, stock car, drag racing, I'm just going to go full speed ahead and I hope you get out the way. Hello, somebody. That is not... That's certainly not the way Jesus lived. The only time Jesus seemed to be crashing into folk was the religious folk. And that should make all of us shudder. See, like everybody else, Jesus was very accommodating. Jesus spent time with everyone that others thought were disqualified. Jesus figured out a way to do some moves in their lives that left them feeling much better about their imago dei, them being created in the image of God, they felt better about that after they got done talking to Jesus than before they encountered him. And see, part of what the challenge I believe in this moment is that our country and our larger world is, is, is characterized by a hierarchy of human value. And we talked about it a few times here, white supremacy, whiteness, these ideas that to be white and male and rich and elite is the ideal of how this country has been constructed. So if you are not white, a racial category, if you're not male, a gendered category, if you are not elite, a, a category of of, of where you are situated in the larger social arrangement. If you are not wealthy, a class description, then your life is not as valuable and many people will spend most of their life reaching for those values, denying that they have been created in the image of God and even if you're not white, if you're not a man, if you're not wealthy, and if you don't have elite status, you are still as valuable to God and to the people of God as those who may have those arbitrary designations. Now, this is so important because I believe some of the reason why we have these challenges around patriarchy, this which, which would be defined as a hierarchy of human value based on maleness that is reinforced by power. So this idea that in order to be valuable to the lead, to have a, 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 an opinion or a perspective that, that, that is worthy on its own merits, you have to be a man. It's a very challenging and, and oppressive assumption. It is just as challenging and oppressive an assumption if you uh, 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 insert the racial category there, which we are all so familiar with, right? This idea that if you are, 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 are black or brown or Asian or indigenous, that your voice may not matter or measure or be taken as seriously if you are not white. And we all, you know, we can problematize that. Everybody feel like that should not be the case. But we have yet to move as a church into the problematizing of patriarchy, of sexism. And what happens when we don't do that? The language of a Donald Trump, though we may condemn it publicly, could still be a part of our unconscious sensibility that causes us to treat one another in ways that are less than God's intent and certainly less than how God values us. I mean, Sister Sharia said it so powerfully, particularly here in the church, the most practical reason we ought to have these conversations is because at least half of the, 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 the population of the Christian church in the world are black, dark-skinned women. So if you are a woman and if you are dark-skinned, 
then you need to realize, man, this is an important conversation for me as a Christ follower. And if you are a man, it is important for us because even though women make up the large majority of our populations, women do not make up the leadership, much of the decision making, and their voices are not often carried with the same kind of weight. So if the Son has come to set us free, how is it that we can have half of our church oppressed? And we can be shouting. Ooh. And we can be okay with not having a conversation, engaging acts of repentance and healing and restoration. How many of you know that it is not just enough for you and I to practice the, 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 the historical uh, uh, sacraments of our faith, baptism, communion, marriage, preaching, and not have a radical transformation of how we see one another. I want to start with God because I do believe that if you don't start with God, you are cheating yourself. Hallelujah. Because God's intent is not an intent that we are experiencing today. The fallenness, human weakness has left you and I radically living beneath our privilege. And when I see this passage of God interacting with Moses, I find it to be paradigmatic of how I hope then we move through this series, we interact with one another. The first way that I see God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, living in a community of difference, but yet still one, interdependent on one another, but not distinguished from one another. The way I see God interacting with humanity through this text is so powerful and it is prescriptive. The first thing I want you to see, my brothers and sisters, if we will engage in this moment and season of necessary Sawubona, the first thing you and I must do, we must see. Somebody holler, I must see, I must see. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, we must see, we must see. Verse number seven says, God has seen the misery of my people. It is important for you and I to have eyes, listen, that can see the suffering of others without qualification, without trying to determine why it's that way, without trying to assign blame, without trying to solve it at first glance, but just being able to see it. How many of you know that it is very hard for many of us to see one another fully? This, this, great, this great term called intersectionality is so important in our conversations about how we see one another because depending on who you are and how you've been shaped and formed, you can, only, you can see some folk only in one or two kinds of ways. But how many of you know even those one or two kinds of ways are not fully able to describe the brilliance and the complexity of how God made us? When the scripture says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, the scripture is not trying to flatten you by your color, flatten you into a gender, flatten you into a sexuality, flatten you into a nation. But God is declaring that in my divine imagination, I took time to make sure you were constituted with such complexity that if you seek me first, I will help you understand the fullness of who you are. And how many of you know if you can learn to see yourself fully, you'll easily be able to see others fully and not, not, not limit them to some kind of category description. I had to learn to see the young offender as more than the worst thing he had ever did in his life. 
Right now, God is trying to help me to learn to see corrupt police officers as more than the badge and the uniform. How many of you know all of us got to be open? Ooh, help me, Holy Ghost. To see beyond the limitations of our own eyes. And that's a hard proposition. Because for many of us, we have trained ourselves or been trained to see one another a certain kind of way. So the first question that I want you to wrestle with, how am I conditioned to see the other in my life? And all of us got another. Tell your neighbor, you got another now. You got another. You got someone who you define based off of difference or someone who defines you based off of difference. And the the, the, <laughs> the way Jesus don't let nobody off the hook, because Jesus don't let nobody off the hook. You understand me? I mean, you know, I, I love to follow Jesus when, when, when the enemy of Jesus is an enemy of mine. You know? Oh, when we talk about the Pharisees, oh, yes, Jesus. Yeah, we got to get rid of them Pharisees. <laughs> we talk about the proud, get, we got to get rid of them prideful folk. Jesus talk about violent, you get real quiet. <laughs> oh, my spirit is willing, but this whole flesh. <laughs> Touch your neighbor, tell him this flesh, this flesh. Who is the other that all of us have to wrestle with? And the, 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 the other thing that I, I feel compelled to lift up, do I see their difference as a compliment or a disqualifier? Now, in gendered relationships, we have often over-defined, I believe, our relationships in the world through the use of certain texts over others. I mean, one great example, did you not know that in the book of Genesis, there are two creation narratives, particularly as it relates to how human beings were created. Genesis chapter 1 says that God created humanity in the image of God, male and female. He created them. But then in Genesis chapter 2, a more longer description or a alternative description, depending on which scholars you read, talk about that God put Adam to sleep and took a rib out of the side of Adam and created Eve. Now, depending on who you are and how you read them texts, some folk would try to say that the scriptures argue that women are a little lower than men. And others would argue and read the text from what they would call a liberative framework. <laughs> and they would say, but God created male and female in the image of God. How can both be created in the image of God, but one be a little lower than the other? Much ink has been spilt on those two questions. <laughs> But I do believe the, the, the ethic of do no harm and, and, and sacrificial love evens out whatever kind of, of narrative you want to use because if you are using the biblical text to diminish the value of a human being creating the image of God, then your hermeneutics, your exegesis, and every one of your nice theological words are arguably being used not to heal, but to hurt. So one of the questions we have to ask is, how then do we make sure 
that we see one another with eyes that do not cause harm, but eyes that actually see the fullness of who we've been created to be. Somebody to holler, we must see. The second thing that I see God uh, telling uh, 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 Moses as God is revealing God's self to Moses is God says, we must hear. So not only must you see, but you and I have to learn to hear. The scripture says that I have heard them crying out. Many of us are quick to speak and very slow to listen or hear. And it don't matter who's talking. God could be talking and you just, you, you just so, you talk so much, you know. When I used to, you know, have my prayer uh, times, uh, when I was younger and I would pray like hours at a time, I would pray for about an hour. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just want to thank you for being so good to me. And I want you to do this for me. And, and God, I just, and literally, I, 45 minutes, I start speaking in tongues. I mean, I just be going in. Then when I get tired, my jaw start hurting. I leave five minutes for God to speak. Quick to speak. Slow to listen. Now, if I'm that way with God, can you imagine how slow I can be to listen to the cries of people around me. If we're going to experience a moment, a season of Savabona, we have to be able to hear one another's stories in all their complexity, all their contradiction, all their pain. Because it ain't like your story, like, you know, fits perfectly with a nice bow on top. I wish I had honest church this morning. Y'all kind of quiet. There is no perfect story in the house. There is no story <laughs> that is without its loose ends. Hello, somebody. There is no story, no cry that does not require a curious and listening ear. And if God is able to hear the cries of the suffering, why is it that we can't? Why is it that we, the church, can't hear the suffering of those around us? Why is it that in a month, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, we can't sensitize our ears to the ways in which violence is visited upon those in our community? What is it about how the church and followers of Jesus have been conditioned that we can't hear the suffering of the prisoner, the suffering of the oppressed, the suffering of the LGBTQ, the suffering of the immigrant, the suffering of the Muslim, the suffering of the rich, the suffering of the poor. Why is it that our ears have been trained in such a way that depending on who they are, we can hear them, but if they are a certain group, we can't. You see, if our liberation is really bound up with one another, we have to learn to at least be able to hear everyone's story. We have to be able to not allow the speaker to be categorized by our biases 
and the ways in which we assign value to their voice based on who they are. Hello, somebody. There's all kind of research we've done in our, in our, in our work that if we use certain kinds of young children with lighter skin, that we can get more empathy all across the country on issues that affect disproportionately those with darker skin. All kind of research out there that says we have been conditioned to hear the pain of certain voices more than others. When the sisters are lifting up their voice, I've been particularly challenged by uh, the way in which The Birth of a Nation, uh, the film that uh, is directed by Nate Parker, who has these allegations that, 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 that span decades, or at least an uh, incident happened with him in college, but it's been allegations that have been lingering for quite some time. And I had to learn to listen to the survivors of sexual assault. In a way, because, you know, my only sexual assault has been at the hands of police officers. So, you know, when you start talking about police, I'm all ears. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, them, they, them, 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 that piece of work. It don't, it don't take long for me to make the leap, right? Because <laughs> I have a precondition in my mind that makes that leap don't even seem like a jump. It's like a quick step. But I'm, I've not been raped and sexually assaulted by another man or a woman. So there are a whole lot of experiences around that. I can't even, I'm not sensitized to, but when I'm around some sisters who start weeping and talking to me in ways when they read certain transcripts or hear certain remarks, I have to rewire the way I hear. Not to try and determine who's guilty, who's innocent, but to realize that their voices matter. And if their voices matter to me, then I have to make sure I'm creating conditions in the world where they are not re-traumatized. Hello, somebody. Re-traumatized, listen, intentionally or unintentionally. Because good intentions don't mean a lot when you're in pain. Hello, somebody. Someone can run over my foot unintentionally with a Mack truck. And they little sorry ain't going to keep me from having to go to the doctor. They put a cast on my foot, had me limping around for months. That sorry not going to immediately heal my foot. So how many know good intentions ain't, ain't that, 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 that's, that's not enough. You and I have to be able to hear. And in this moment, y'all, Our country is becoming more and more unable to hear the voices of the oppressed and the marginalized. And God forbid that we, many of us who identify as oppressed, marginalized people, reinscribe the same pathology where we can't hear one another's cries because we so sanctified. Oh, my time is gone. Lord, have mercy. Second question then you got to ask yourself. Can you hear the stories and the pain of the suffering and the oppressed in your midst? Do you value certain voices over others because of gendered or racial norms? Yeah, this, 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 this not going to be no, no, no shouting sermon today, I guess. Y'all come back next week, praise God. Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll roll under, under the pews next week. The third thing, verse number seven says, I know all about their pain. If you're going to experience Salabona, you, we must learn. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them you got a lot to learn. You got a lot to learn. How many know some of the hardest folk to teach anything to is church folk? Or people you know. Or people that know you. Huh? But I want to speak to all of us. You can't learn to see one another fully if you don't have the capacity to learn. 
I know for many of us, this stuff gets so uncomfortable. We're like, man, I'm just trying to serve Jesus. This is serving Jesus. <laughs> I want you to understand this now. We could easily come in here and get high and intoxicated off the spirit and off all the emotions. And I love that. And we're going to do that from time to time. But when you leave here and you don't have the capacity to listen and see and, and learn, what kind of public witness are you to the liberated forces of the gospel when you can't learn nothing about anybody who's different than you? We did our Latinx Appreciation Month uh, 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 panel a couple weeks ago because even though our congregation is growingly multicultural and I'm excited about that, many of us black folk don't know much about anything. If it ain't our people. Hello, somebody. And even then, we don't know much about that. <laughs> and of course, we know mainstream white culture don't know much about black folk and folk of color. That's another reason why we center in this conversation around black women. Because ain't it something that every one of our textbooks are often centered around white male perspectives? And we don't have no problem absorbing that. Hello, somebody. I, I'm, 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 I'm not trying to mess with y'all too badly, but we, we, can, we, can, we can filter mainstream information that is often fed to us through a white sensibility, through a patriarchal sensibility, but we can't figure out ways to make the voices of women and LGBTQ and indigenous, be the center of a conversation, and then we train our mind on how to make sure that some of that can speak to us, even though it ain't coming to us in a way we used to. This is going to help you to learn that the greatness of God is not limited by our race and our culture and even our religion. But the greatness of God, God says that the earth is the Lord's. What do you think about this? And everything that's in it. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in this earth that you ain't learned about yet. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell them, I got a lot of learning to do. I got a lot of learning to do. And it is God who sees the suffering of the people. And, and I love how in the book of Hebrews, Scripture says that Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. Now, if Jesus got a lot to learn, I'm not trying to say you ain't like on Jesus, you know, level. <laughs> I'm not trying to say that. I hope you ain't trying to say you are, though, praise God. If Jesus got a lot to learn, how many of you know we got just a little bit? I, if you can't say a lot, any a little bit is a little bit. A little bit more to learn, and what better to learn it in community? Last thing I'll say, and then we got to take communion. God. Oh, let, let, let me give you the question. Who then are your teachers? If you're trying to learn something, who are your teachers? What am I not learning because I'm unable to receive knowledge and truth? from unexpected sources? Just a little question for you to humbly consider while you blocking folk out that don't sound like what you want them to sound like. Who are your teachers? I was, I, we were at, at Riverside Church the other day, and, and they were asking me, how can we, you know, learn some of this stuff? I tell them real simple. Go through your bookshelf if you read. <laughs> and who are the folk you read? Are they all of one race? Are they all of one culture? Are they all of one religion? Are they all of one nation? If all you're reading is U.S. born authors, how many know the whole world is not the United States of America? Did you know that? I don't know. I, I, I didn't do good at geography either. But the earth is the Lord's. Think about that. If the whole earth belongs to God, why would you only read American-born authors? Does 
not God revealed God's self to folk in other places? Has not God allowed other folks to have an experience of the divine that may be able to give you another expression of what it means to be free, to be whole, to be healed? Learn something this week that ain't what you already know. Seek out a new source, a new voice. Take somebody to lunch that you've been avoiding because they're just different from you. And don't be quick to talk away what they're talking about. I'm one of them folk, I get in a conversation with somebody, and I'll be like, yeah, but you know what? Yeah, but, you know, my Bible says this. These people don't even believe in the Bible. Why are you talking about that Bible? Hello, somebody. Do you know Jesus talked to the Jews with Scripture, to the non-Jews with parables, Huh? Jesus was able to hit everybody right between the eyes with wisdom and knowledge in a way they could understand. But if all you know is one thing, then that one thing will be your language. Learn something. The last thing I'll say, the scripture says that God came down. And for many of us, this is going to be the hardest part. We must come down. Tell your neighbor, get off your high horse. Get off your high horse. Go ahead, tell them. They need to hear it. They may not like it. (laughs) Get off off your high horse. In your relationships, in your marriage, in your friendships, on your job, get off your high horse and come down. And let your proximity to the other help change and challenge the way you see one another. How I see you from 30,000 feet in the air will be different than how I see when I can look at you in your eyes. This is why in our protest work, we had these great experiments where we will hold a mirror up front of these abusive cops. They had had to look at themselves. Peaceful protesters being brutalized by militarized police. They had to look at themselves. Take a look in the mirror before you do this now. For some of them, I think, you know, they, they pulled back a little bit. Some of them didn't care. But it was easy. It was harder when you're looking at someone and you see their humanity. It's harder for you to condemn someone to hell when you really know them. Ain't it something that every, everybody who you don't know, it's easy for them to be going to hell. Oh, they're hell bound. <laughs> okay, they, they just, they going to hell. That's it. It's hell. They going to hell. <laughs> but when you know folk, you kind of at least praying that they don't go. Am I speaking some truth in here to y'all today? You got to come down and meet people. Don't talk about their life decisions and choices if you have not taken time to learn their pain, hear their story, see them in the image of God. If you don't have the, the, the grace, the compassion to spend time with people, You don't have the right to speak on their life at all. That's the problem with many of us in the church. We we don't meet nobody at the point of their needs, but we quick to offer them a prescription. When When I get sick and Cherise makes me call the doctor, like, you got to call a doctor. Why? They don't know nothing about what I'm going through. <laughs> so I'll be on the first thing they make you do is these phone appointments. You on the phone and you talking to this nurse and you trying to describe to them what's wrong with you. And they always tell me the same thing. Take two Tylenols and if you feel worse, and I'm like, this, this, this is what I mean. An hour of my time wasted. Proximity. You think too far. Hello, somebody. 
Now, when I finally drag my sick behind into the doctor, and they can look at me, look at my wounds, plug me up to the machines, see inside the brokenness of my body, I may take their diagnosis a little more seriously. So what do, you, what, what do we have to do if we're serious about seeing people? God said, I'm coming down and I'm going to put you in spaces that give you a lot of room to grow. Ooh, my loved one today, can you imagine what it would be like to be in a space where God gives you room to grow? I always say that our faith should be like a choir robe, two sizes too big. Not no tailor-made faith where it just hugging you in all the right places. I'm talking about something so big that you always have room to grow into it. This is the faith that has been handed to us. By God, through Jesus and our ancestors, not a faith that you just so sure of that there ain't no room for you to be surprised. But a faith that's comfortable with your questions, not threatened with your inquiries. Got space for the others to be there right along with you. I don't want to be around folk that just are so convinced of heaven that they can't figure out how to live on earth. I, 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 I be praying that certain have some of my conversations and meetings and protests stuff. Lord, I just hope you still let me in. I do want to go to heaven. I do. So don't disqualify me because of the thoughts in my mind, the desires in my flesh, the weakness in my spirit. Lord, Help me to come down. Help me to be where your people are so I may see them as you see me, us, and there I say the world. Come on, stand with me, everyone, and let's take a few moments.